So in this video, we're going to take a quick look at the muscles involved in respiration. So these are the muscles that we use to allow air to rush into our lungs and also to push that air back out of our lungs. So the muscles used for inspiration and expiration. Now before we begin, you need a basic understanding of the physiology. So just very quickly, you need to understand something called Boyle's Law. Now Boyle's Law simply states that the volume of a container is inversely proportional to the pressure within that container. So what I mean is this, that sounds quite confusing, but it's simple. If you have a container of a fixed volume, inside of that container there's going to be a number of gas particles. And those gas particles are going to be bouncing around at all times as gas particles do and they're going to be bouncing off the walls of that container. If you were to measure the pressure inside of that container, you're simply measuring the force generated by those gas particles bouncing off the walls of the container. Now, let's say we take that container and we were to squish it down. We keep the same amount of particles of gas inside, but we now halve its size. Well, what now happens is that the same amount of gas particles have less space to move around and they're more likely to bounce off the walls, which means when you take a measurement of the pressure inside, the pressure is going to be greater because they're going to be more likely hitting off the walls at a greater force, okay? So we've just decreased the volume and increased the pressure, hence the inverse relationship. Again, if you were to take that same container with the same amount of gas inside and you were to double its size by keeping the same amount of gas particles inside, you've now got these gas particles floating around a larger area and there's, a, there's less likelihood that those gas particles are going to bounce off the walls of that container. Therefore, the pressure will be reduced. So by increasing the volume, you're decreasing the pressure. Now this is important and it's also important if you take this piece of information in consideration to this piece of information, that gas will always move from an area of high gas pressure to an area of low gas pressure, okay? You watch this on the news or the weather, I should say, all the time. The weather man or woman will say that there's a high pressure system moving in. This is simply saying that high pressure gases are coming towards an area where there's low pressure gases. Now take these two pieces of information together and what that means is this. Our lungs sit within our thoracic cavity. So here's our thoracic cavity, okay? Now, our lungs are adherent to that thoracic wall. So, if we were to increase the volume of our thoracic cavity, we are effectively decreasing the pressure inside of our lungs. That means that the lungs, the pressure inside the lungs is decreased or reduced compared to the external environment and therefore gas wants to rush towards that negative pressure. So all that air will come in to our lungs through our nasal cavity, through our oral cavity, down to the lungs. If we were to decrease the volume of our thoracic cavity, we're increasing the pressure in our lungs and air wants to rush out. So that's how we breathe in and out. And the way we do this is by contracting muscles. So, let's first look at the muscles used in inspiration, breathing in. The major muscle you need to be aware of involved in inspiration is the diaphragm. Now, the diaphragm is the muscle that separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. It is basically the anatomical barrier between those two cavities. It's an unpaired skeletal muscle that's dome-shaped, okay? Now, a couple of pieces of information. In order for you to understand the diaphragm a little bit better, I've drawn up this picture. Now you may look at this picture and think, this is making things worse, that's a terrible picture, but let me try and orientate you to what we're looking at. So what we've just done is we've done a transverse section through me, right at the thoracic and abdominal junction or barrier, which is right where the diaphragm is. We've cut straight through and now we're looking up through. Using your eyes, you're looking up through to my thoracic cavity, which means what you're looking up at is my diaphragm, okay? Now, you can see that there's gonna be the front and the back, anterior, posterior. That's the ziphoid or, or part of the sternum, and here's the ribs coming around towards the back, and then you can see some of the lumbar vertebrae telling you exactly where we're looking at, the very top of the lumbar vertebrae, L1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, a couple of points you should be aware of for the diaphragm is that you can see that the diaphragm is attached by these ligaments to the lumbar portion of our spine. This is called the crust of the diaphragm, okay? And it's attached there, so there's anchorage points. The diaphragm's also attached 
to the thoracic wall, which you can see here, and the sternum as well. Now, there's three major holes in the diaphragm, okay? Now, two true holes, one which isn't really a hole. Let's talk about that one first. At the very back of the diaphragm, which you can see here, pretty much against our vertebrae, you've got a blood vessel that's coming down from the heart through the diaphragm down to the rest of the body. This blood vessel is called the aorta and it's the major artery coming away from the heart that feeds the body with oxygenated blood. Now, this aorta doesn't actually go through a hole in the diaphragm, it actually goes through a gap behind the diaphragm, posterior to the diaphragm. This is important because if the aorta went through a hole in the diaphragm, it, may, it means that any time the diaphragm contracts, it may grossly impede blood flow. And we obviously don't want that happening coming from a major arterial blood vessel. The other two holes is one here and one here. This one here is what's called our esophageal hiatus, basically the hole that allows the esophagus to come through. This one up here is a cavity or a hiatus that allows for the vena cava to move through. So I said the aorta is the major artery coming down from the heart, the vena cava is the major vein going back to the heart, so it's actually coming back up through the diaphragm. Okay? Now the diaphragm is innervated by a nerve called the phrenic nerve, and the phrenic nerve comes from cervical regions three, four, and five. So phrenic nerve, phrenic nerve comes from cervical three to cervical five, and you can remember that C345 keeps you alive. So this is, now you may be thinking, if the diaphragm's down there, I know that C3, 4, and 5 are up here. So why is it that there's a nerve or a nerve plexus that's coming from the neck innervating the diaphragm? And that's simply because embryologically, if you've looked at the embryology lectures, the diaphragm originated up in the neck, okay? And so it's basically pulled those nerves down. So the diaphragm, when it contracts, it's pulling on these tendons, it's pulling on all its connections to the thoracic cavity, and what it does is it pulls on this white thing here. You're probably thinking, what is this white thing that I've drawn? It's not another hole. In actual fact, this white thing is filled with collagen, and it's actually a tendon, okay? So I've drawn all these red lines here to indicate that that's muscle, that skeletal muscle of the diaphragm. This big white part right in the middle is a tendon called the central tendon. So when the diaphragm contracts, all of this skeletal muscle pulls and it pulls on that central tendon and what that means is, I told you it's a dome shape, as it pulls it flattens that central tendon down which means it increases the thoracic volume that decreases the pressure and air rushes in. So the diaphragm when it contracts is the major or main muscle for inspiration. Okay? Now, there are other muscles used in inspiration, what we call accessory muscles. And why are they called accessory muscles? Because we basically just need the diaphragm to, to bring air in and out when we do what's called quiet breathing. So the breathing you're doing right now when you're sitting down, when you're relaxing, it's called quiet breathing and you're breathing in about half a litre of air, out half a litre of air, in half a litre, out half a litre, simply by the diaphragm contracting, relaxing, contracting, relaxing. But there's other muscles called accessory muscles that allow us to do what's called forced inspiration. <sighs> Breathe in more than that 500 mils of air. So let's talk about those muscles. Now, I've drawn a picture of the body, thoracic area, the external anatomy basically, and you can see some uh, bones and some of the musculature. So let's orientate you. So this is, these are the clavicles up here. This is the sternum, coming down here. Here we've got the first five ribs attached to the sternum, okay? And it's up the other side too, but hidden by this muscle, which I'll talk about in a sec. And then six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, coming out here, and I haven't got the floating ribs or anything like that. And then we've got the red stuff are all muscles that are attached to it, so let's talk about it. Now, when you take a breath in and it's forced, if we need to bring more air in than that quiet breath and that 500 mils, we need to increase the thoracic volume even more. The more you increase the thoracic volume, the less the pressure gets inside, so the more negative it gets inside, and the more air that rushes in. Which means the more muscles you recruit to increase the thoracic volume, 
the more air will come in, okay? So, let's talk about some of these muscles that we're going to recruit for inspiration. All right, so probably the first muscle I should state because it also is involved in quiet inspiration, but is definitely involved in forced inspiration, is what we call the external intercostal muscles. Now, costal means cartilage, inter means between, intercostal means between cartilage. What we're referring to is the muscles that sit between the ribs, okay? Now, external intercostals tells you that it sits more externally to another set of intercostal muscles called the internal. Now, the internal are used for forced expiration. So don't get those two too confused. So firstly, for forced inspiration, external intercostals, and you'll see that they are orientated like this. Okay? These are the external intercostals, and when they contract, they pull up the rib that's below them, okay? Which means they pull up and out the rib cage. What does that mean? If you're pulling up and out the rib cage again, you're increasing the thoracic volume. So these are the external intercostals. External intercostals. Okay? Now, next muscle is or group of muscles are the pectoralis muscles. So the pecs. Now you've got the pec major, pec minor. So let's have a look. What I've drawn here is obviously clavicles. Here's the deltoid, so the shoulder, and the start of the bicep, the tricep here. Now, that's part of the lat, so I just want to show you basically coming down here. This is the pec. This is actually pec major, the largest pec muscle, and you can see it coming in, attaching to the clavicle, attaching to the sternum, and so forth. So when the pectoralis major muscle contracts, it pulls on the sternum and ribs, and again, lifts it up. So think when you take a big deep breath in, you contract the pectoralis major muscles and it lifts it up and out, again increasing thoracic volume. Decreasing lung pressure, air rushes in, inspiration, okay? Now, this is innervated by the pectoralis nerve and this is coming for, from around about C3 to C8, okay? Cervical 3, cervical 8 and a bit of T1, thoracic 1. And it, like I said, comes from the pectoralis nerve. These nerves also innovate pectoralis minor. Now pectoralis minor is this muscle right here. And what you can see is pectoralis minor is coming in and is attaching to rib three, four, and five, which means when you contract pectoralis minor, it's going to lift rib three, four, and five again, increasing thoracic volume. So we can then state that we've also got pec minor involved and pec major. What else is involved in forced inspiration? Well, we've also got the serratus muscles. The serratus muscles, the serratus anterior, are these muscles here that you can see look like they're attached to the ends of the rib. And again, when you contract them, they're gonna shift the ribs as well, increase in thoracic volume. So, these muscles here are the serratus anterior, you've got a muscle called the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Now the sternocleidomastoid muscle, sterno, sternum, clido or cleido means clavicle, mastoid referring to the jaw. So this is a big strap-like muscle which you can see attaches to the clavicle here and to the sternum as well. Now let's write it down first. Because it's such a big word, I can't talk and write it at the same time. Sternocleidomastoid. And again, when this muscle contracts, it's gonna lift everything up and out, okay? Again, increasing thoracic volume. Now this muscle's innervated by the cranial nerve 11. I wanted to bring that up because maybe you've gone through cranial nerves already, maybe not. Cranial nerve 11, oh, 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 to touch and feel, very good, velvet, ah, heaven. It starts with A, it's the spinal accessory nerve, sometimes also known as the spinal nerve. So this nerve helps to, it's not the only nerve that innervates it, but helps to innervate the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Now another muscle that's involved is this muscle, which sort of sits next to and behind the sternocleidomastoid, which is called the scalenes. And you've got the anterior, middle, and posterior scalenes. 
and you can see that these scalenes are attached to the first and second ribs. Again, contracting, lifting them up, increasing thoracic volume. So these are the major muscles that are involved in, ex accessory muscles I should say, involved in forced inspiration. So quiet inspiration, diaphragm and external intercostals, forced inspiration, definitely external intercostals, the pec muscles, the sternocleidomastoid, serratus anterior and scalenes, these are the muscles involved in inspiration.